Hello. Now then, I'd like you to listen to a couple of sounds. He was a complete creation of his own making. I was the very, very first in the whole world. I've got plenty of other people. I've got uh, four sisters and two brothers. They've all got plenty of kids. I've got plenty of kids on Jim will fix it. So my kids, uh, to me anyway, the best sorts of kids is they all go home to their parents. Me to do things for him. He wanted me to fondle him. He asked me for oral sex. We gave him every instrument that he needed in Brooklyn prey on some extremely damaged individuals. Sir James Savile OBE, the man who has single-handedly raised more than 30 million pounds for charity. Why have you said in interviews that you don't have emotions? Because it's easier. The truth is I'm very good at masking them. I'm a rare breed insofar as I'm a single fella. Uh, and which is why when people say, them five places you've got to live in. Aren't they expensive? I said, not as expensive as a wife. Now, the Metropolitan Police say that it will now take the lead in investigating sex abuse allegations against the late Sir Jimmy Savile as more women come forward claiming to have been assaulted by the television presenter. Who's your best pal, Tony? Oh, look, No, Desmond. He's not. He is. No, he's not. Get off me. Because he's a married man. Okay. Yes, you do. Oh. Well, no, I'm just <laughs> not until you say me. Now, me, when I stand in front of the table and St. Peter's there, he says, you are not coming in. Uh, and I'll say, well, why not? And he say, because you're a villain. And, and he'll show me the debit side. And I'll say, hang about. And I'll show him the credit side. And he does that mean anything? And if he says, that means nothing, then I'll threaten to break his fingers. What does she do with the cable, boys? <laughs> and I didn't want to. And he promised me that if I gave him oral sex, that he would arrange for me and my friends to go to Television Central and be on his television show. Hey, hey, hey! We've got it all happening tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody's around. We're going to start with our guests. I hope it's been a very good week for you, and here's a very good set of fix it for you. Here we go now with a letter from Lee. Yeah, Lee. Me. So I promise. I promise. That you. Jimmy Savile. <laughs> Jimmy Savile. Are the only one. Are the only one. In my life. I was 14. Of course I wanted to go to television centre. I didn't want to give him more sex. I thought it was disgusting, but I did that. Okay. Gary Glitter was one example. He was particularly horrible and only interested in getting as much sex as he could possibly get from any girl. I'd start with manipulative, then controlling, and very, very clever. It has become a great British institution. Not bad for just another zany DJ. But there's a lot more to cigar-smoking Jimmy than meets the eye. I can remember seeing him having sex with one of the girls from Dunkroft in Jimmy Saddle's dressing room. I was the very, very first in the whole world to run a dance to record. <laughs> you used to be a wrestler, didn't you? Right. I need a lamp. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm feared in every girls' school in this country. Hello, and welcome once again to the Death Cast. I am your host, best selling author Ian Totten, and I'd like to thank you for joining me once again as we prepare to take a second look at the life and crimes of Sir Jimmy Seville, OBE. Before we get into the second part, I'd like to thank everybody who has responded to part one on social media. I've never had this type of reaction to a series that I'm doing, and it's pretty humbling especially from the British people who have contacted me, thanking me for covering this story. It's not hyperbole to say that this is a case that has pretty much consumed me for the last nine years, and unlike certain individuals who will latch on to a case and then try and tell their narrative of it, the story of Jimmy Seville really is probably 
the one that I am best suited to tell just because I have studied it so extensively and read. I, I, we're talking thousands upon thousands of documents and reports and books and newspaper articles and film archives. Really, if you, you name it, I, I've read it and jested it just in an effort to, you know, not only understand what happened with Jimmy Seville, the whole Seville situation, how it happened, how it was allowed to happen, but also what really happened. And I say that because this may upset some people, but the narrative that has been going around for the last decade or so really isn't the truth of things, at least from my conclusions after so much research, and you're going to see that as we progress, especially in later episodes where I'm actually going to read you excerpts from some of the various reports that were prepared regarding Seville. Uh, I'm going to read to you quite extensively from the Dave James Janet Smith report, which was a report that came out from the BBC, who were in cover their ass mode at the time. Before we get into all of that, however, as you can tell, I have a horrific cold, so I am recording this late on Sunday afternoon, and hopefully my nasal voice doesn't turn anyone off. We have our normal plugs. If you'd like to follow me on social media, that would be on Facebook, Instagram, uh, MeWe, YouTube. You can find me under both Ian Tot and Author. But you can also find the Deathcast on most of those sites. You also find me on Twitter under Corpse Creek. If you like and enjoy the show, I encourage you to subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave a five-star review. They really do help the show appear in more searches. If you are interested in signing up to the mailing list, you can go to CorpseCreekPublishing.com, click the sign-up button, and you're in. If you want to help with the production of this show or you just want to say thanks for a good job buy me a cup of coffee while on corpse creek publishing click on the donate button no amount is too small and certainly no amount is too large if you're interested in in finding any of my novels you can go to amazon.com just search for ian totten my latest release maggie came out on November 30th. And if you're interested in getting an autographed copy of any of my six novels, that would be The Blood Gods Trilogy, The House of Silver Doors, The Throwaway Girls of Olympia, or Maggie, contact me at ian at corpsecreekpublishing.com. Send me an email. Let me know what it is you're looking for. We can exchange some money, and I will send it out to you. Lastly, I've been plugging this for the last few weeks. If you want to help a animal shelter, you know, no-kill shelter, place that actually, it's a rescue. They try and find animals that have been rescued. They try and find them new homes. You can find it in the show notes, uh, but I'll throw it out right here. Just go to PayPal and look for Day One Animal Rescue. Again, that will be in the show notes. It's uh, Animal Rescue was started by a young woman who sadly passed away very young in February. That's Day One Animal Rescue. I know they are on Facebook. They are also on Instagram. Now that all of that is out of the way, get yourself something to drink, find a nice comfy seat, sit back, relax. I've got my coffee, I've got my cigarettes. Let's go into the crypt. As we left off last week, Seville had just been transferred from London to Manchester to a dance hall called the 
plaza. And almost instantaneously, he made a splash in the area. Normally, the plaza dance halls, as well as the other mecha dance halls throughout the United Kingdom, were only open at night. Seville started hosting lunchtime dances, which led to him butting heads with various employers around the area, as well as the schools, because students would leave school during their lunch hour and go to his dances and then come back late, and this invariably led to the headmasters, which in the United States we call principals, complaining to him that he was taking time away from the students' studies. Obviously, Seville did not care about any of this. He was only concerned with turning a profit for a business which would further enrich him, as well as building the mythos of Jimmy Seville. It was also around this time that Seville began wearing the outlandish outfits that he became known for. He had no problems, you know, showing off his body by wearing you know, see-through fishnet shirts, um, you know, all sorts of just really strange and out there fashion choices. And this was a calculated risk on his part. He was trying to draw attention to both himself and to fans. And as I discussed last week, he talked about how he realized that being odd or being different would work to his advantage. So he really began experimenting with this changing of his persona from just this really, you know, weird, uh, eccentric, charismatic individual to something else entirely, something that had never been seen before. This included eventually when Seville would have start having his hair dyed. One particular thing of interest is stories have come out since Seville's death about his office at the plaza. He had a large couch inside of it, and he was known to tell his underlings that he was going to quote-unquote interview a young woman inside of office, which is really, you know, parlance for saying, hey, I'm, we're going to be getting it on in here, do not disturb. Whether any of these young women were under the age at the time that these activities occurred is really not known, but it is understood that Seville had a propensity to really aim for 16, 17-year-olds. Some people have said that he went so far as to go after 14 and 15-year-olds. During this specific period of his life, however, there is not a lot of evidence to say with certainty whether or not he was legally breaking the law. Morally, depending on where you stand on all of this, he was either doing nothing wrong, or he was, you know, acting inappropriately with children. My personal opinion on that matter is he was acting inappropriately with children. That would put him into the category of pedophile. However, in the interest of fairness, that term really didn't exist at this period of time in either Great Britain or anywhere else for that matter. And if he was taking advantage of girls who were 16, 17 years old, legally he was not doing anything wrong under British law. Gonna read a quick blurb from Dan Davies' excellent book, In Plain Sight, The Life and Lies of Jimmy Seville. This is a quote from a man by the name of Jimmy Donnelly, who was 16 years old at this period of time when he was attending the plaza. In them days, it was hard to say who was a pedophile. We didn't have the word pedophile back then. We had the word weirdo. And 
Seville was a weirdo. He always had the Bobby Sox girls, the young girls, in his cars. He'd always pull up with girls in his car, and going home, he'd always have girls in his car. And this is really something that's important to note, because what Seville was doing at this period of time was honestly no different from what rock stars such as the Beatles and Elvis Presley and any other name from the 60s, 70s, and even the 80s that you can think of. They were all doing this type of stuff. They called them groupies at the rock and roll world. Women like to go to and be seen with men who they, you know, believe to be either powerful or to be celebrities. Whether that's right or wrong is inconsequential in the context of this. It is what it is. That's the reality of things. And you still, you go to a concert today and there's a long line of young women, some of them easily not underage, who are in line to meet their quote-unquote heroes. That's a nice way of saying they're trying to get backstage so they can have sex with them. And for anyone who thinks that I'm spinning a yarn, the stories about the guys from Led Zeppelin are rife with tales of them having sex with, legally in the United States, underage girls, but girls who were in Britain of age. There's a famous story about Jimmy Page keeping a girl some stories say hostage, I don't know if that's the reality of it, but he basically kept her under lock and key to do with as he pleased for a period of time. Then there's the stories of Elvis Presley, who was known to have a thing for much younger women, one of whom was Priscilla, who I believe was 14 or so when she and Elvis met, although obviously his media arm, Colonel Robert Parker, you know, tried to paint it off as though it was a absolutely moral thing that the two of them were involved in, and there was nothing untoward going on, and that she and Elvis did not do anything together until she was of legal age, which, if you believe that, I have a farm to sell you in North Dakota. To think that someone with that type of name recognition, popularity, and power would put themselves into a position with a young girl and then not do anything with that individual is the height of idiocy. So what Seville was doing at this time, and in fact what he did throughout his career, was very common among the entertainment crowd, particularly the rock and roll music around. Some of the ways that Seville was able to accomplish this is A, his flamboyant personality, the way he dressed, the kind of cars he drove. He put an air out that he was a multi-millionaire. There are stories of him walking around with a wad of cash in his top breast pocket, which Seville later said he had a couple larger bills on the outside, but on the inside it was either paper or much smaller bills, but he did that in order to put out an air that he was a somebody. He also was known in his personal life to continue on with the frugal manner of lifestyle that he had maintained while he worked in the mines and while he was living in the abandoned barge in Basically, Seville did anything he could to save a dime and to cut corners and pinch pennies wherever he could because having come from nothing, he didn't want to go back to it. So he very rarely, if ever, spent any of his own money if he could avoid it. That included paying people that worked at the Plaza Hotel. Seville also began courting... uh, controversy around this time. He was known for 
putting up fairly salacious advertisements outside of the plaza in order to entice teenagers to come and check out his dances. This next little bit comes again from Dan Davies' seminal work on Jimmy Seville, The Life and Lies. He put posters up around locally advertising, quote-unquote, Saturday night is crumpet night. When he caught flack from his regional supervisor over this, he changed it to read Saturday for Kite. If you don't know what that means, it's basically, and I apologize for being rude here, but it's basically saying, come to the... Uh, dance on Saturday if you want to get laid. Crumpet and kife are both euphemisms for a female's genitalia. The young people in and around Manchester knew what these words meant, and it caused a bit of a stir among the local populace. But Seville was already in the process of building up his outer layer of protection. His boss at Mecca may have been upset by the advertisements that he was putting up, but he couldn't deny the success that Seville was having. But Seville was also in the process of ingratiating himself to the local police forces. Befriending local law enforcement is something that Seville would do Throughout the remainder of his life, he would build this safety net up around himself and call these individuals by various names. One of the things that we're going to get into later, but we'll touch on briefly here, is wherever Silkville went in the United Kingdom, he had what he referred to as teams. Now, that could be groups of girls who were part of his entourage who were really there just for you know thrills and that kind of stuff it could also include members of law enforcement or of the local government who Seville was in tight with he had a way of making these types of individuals feel special and needed as he collected them around him like some type, you know, bobbles or something. Seville did this everywhere he went, and Manchester was really the start of that. He got the local police to be a part of his group, uh, one of whom was a man by the name of Inspector Lewis Harper, who it was said acted as Seville's quote-unquote eyes and ears, We can only speculate on what that means, although I suspect it is that Seville would use this man to find out if there were any rumblings either in the local press, possibly in law offices or in the court, or with parents about Seville's activities. Another individual that Seville came into contact with was a former professional wrestler. See, I told you these guys this many, many moons ago that damn near everything I do can always be brought back to professional wrestling. And here is the first bit of professional wrestling in this story. There was a retired wrestler who lived in Manchester at this time by the name of Bill Benny. Benny went under the moniker of Man Mountain and also Man Mountain Benny. Benny owned a casino as well as a cabaret club that was adjacent to the plaza. He was also known to be a local pimp or a quote-unquote pudding eater. Benny was also known as something of a hard-handed individual. There is a lot of speculation and some evidence that it was through Benny that Seville may have come into contact with organized crime, which in the UK in the late 50s, early 1960s would more likely have been not been the 
Gray Twins. Benny was really you know, the godfather of Manchester at this period of time, and Seville learned a lot from him, including how to brutalize unruly patrons without getting in true trouble with the police, and this is something that Seville would brag about years and years later, this brutalizing of unruly customers. Almost always the individual being brutalized was either a teenage boy or someone in their early 20s who got out of line with one of Seville's staff or more likely than not got out of hand with a woman who was at the club. Seville liked to project this air that Although he was saying racy things, his dances were a place where parents could feel safe sending their daughters because he wasn't a lecherous man who was trying to get into these girls' pants. No, heaven forbid, he was trying to protect them. And one of the ways he went about showing that he was protecting these girls was by making examples of young men who would get out of line with the girls. We will get back into that in just a moment. For me in time, best selling author of the House of Silver Dolls, the Blood Gotch Trilogy, and the Throwaway Girls Olympia, comes Maggie, a book which New York Times best selling author Keith Elliott Greenberg has called. A classic detective story, well-crafted, and a supernatural vortex. Maggie, the name was burned into Lieutenant Carl Jablonski's mind like a brand and had been since the night of the fire. He doubted he would ever forget that night or how she had danced in the flames of her burning home. Maggie... Who was she and why did no one in Kaya's Crossing seem interested in talking about her or her family? These were questions without answers. Quandaries that drove Carl on as he explored the darkest of the town's secrets, desperate to unravel the knots that tied everything together. Maggie, Carl felt haunted by a visage, even as the local reporter, George Murphy, told them of the blood-soaked history that lay along their path and the horrors that it held. None of it seemed real, and yet it was. The sacrifices, the screams, the pact with the nameless ones, and the hell that she had endured. Maggie, hers was a crime begging to be solved, and he and George are the only ones with enough heart to do it. The real question is, will they survive long enough to do it? Maggie, available 11, 30, 2021, in paperback and hardcover. Ebook pre orders are now available at Amazon.com. Only from Corpse Creek Publishing. You have been. Welcome back. So there are stories of Seville locking young men in the basement of the dance hall, chained to pipes or to the boiler. Sometimes they are just left there for hours on end. At other times they are physically assaulted. Whether this is sexual in nature or just a beating is left to the individual's imagination. Seville never gave specifics about these kinds of things other than to say that when the individual left, he understood that he was lucky to get away and would not be coming back to the plaza. Seville also had his bouncers at the club do things such as physically eject unruly patrons from the club, usually by means of physically picking them up and ramming them 
through the door. Kind of like what you would see in a movie. They pick them up, they carry them out, and up on the way out, the person's head slams into the door as they're being dragged into the street and thrown to the ground. Whether or not this is true, these are the stories that Seville and people who knew him at the time have gone on the record as stating happened. To quote Seville, I couldn't care less. Tied them up, put them down in the boiler house until I was ready for them. They'd plead to get out. Nobody ever used to get out of my place. I was judge, jury, and executioner. give you an example of how Seville treated the amount of young women that used to come into his clubs. At some period, a police officer came in to inquire why so many young girls were inside, and Seville stated, I said to the police chief, You do know your 16-year-old daughter comes in here, don't you? Would you rather she was safe here with me or being preyed on by all those scumbags and slags? That's the type of thing that Seville did throughout his year. He tried to really project this almost saintly aura about himself. of You can trust your girl with Jimmy Seville or your daughter with her that nothing untoward is going to happen because of any of these under their individuals. At the same time, while bragging about his sexual conquests, and it kind of put people off in that, on the one hand, they felt, oh, this guy's not going to let anything go on with my daughter. The other hand, they're, uh, you know, he's being a card, he's telling us about, you know, all of the things he's getting into. They never in their wildest dreams connected the fact that if he's having all these sexual conquests, who's to say my daughter is not among them? Because of how popular Seville was becoming at the dance hall in Manchester, he eventually ended up getting a phone call from Granada Television who were looking for somebody who would be able to engage with the youth. There isn't any surviving footage of his first time on television. Apparently, it was for some news program or other. However, according to Seville, the interview went so well that after it was over, the heads of Granada Television came to him and said, Will you come back next week? Again, according to Seville... The fallout from his first television appearance was instantaneous as the that night at the dance hall, the cues for people trying to get into the club were around the corner, and when he inquired as to what was going on, he was informed that all of these people had seen him on television, and because he was a local guy and many of them knew him, he was now famous and they wanted to be with and be around him so out of this TV appearance Seville gets a series on Granada television which he stated only lasted a few uh, weeks before he was fired he told the Guardian in April of 2000 I said to Granada I want to expose a book it's for children and it's dreadful there's this, this girl who's well underage. She takes up with a geezer who's young's old, and eventually they schlep off together. According to Seville, the book he was talking about was Peter Pan. But apparently, this really upset the people at Granada Television, and they let him go. Whether this is true or not, I have no idea of verifying. Again, Seville told a lot of stories in his life. It could well be that this happened. It could also be that somebody in Granada either saw some, him doing something or they caught wind of the rumors of the things that Seville was purported to be up to at that time. It is interesting to note, however, that as was so often the case in Seville's life, 
he made a joke about a younger girl and an older man and how reprehensible he thought that was despite the fact that he was an older guy going after younger girls. So Seville was really talking out of both sides of his neck. On the one hand, he's, you know, stating how awful it is these older guys go after younger girls, and if your girls come to my club, they'll be safe. On the other hand, he's going after these girls and doing Lord knows what with them and being really open about it. But he had such a dual personality and such a strong personality that people really seemed to dismiss the things he was doing and the things he was saying out of hand of, oh, that's just Jimmy Seville being Jimmy Seville. And this is something that continued throughout his life much as the hints of violence continued throughout his life. According to Seville, he hired a group of men who Hungarians to act as hired muscle at his club in order to deal with what he always termed as the villains. Basically, that was anybody who was not following Seville's rules. Again, I spoke of this a few moments ago. You know, they would beat these kids up, but Seville made certain that no marks were ever left. And this is, I believe, something he learned from Bill Benny. Seville liked to brag, too, about his connections to the underworld that were fostered during this period of time. And would tell people in later years that a lot of the people who worked for him were also employed by the craze. Again, this is something Seville did throughout his life. He liked to paint this image of a, you know, saintly individual while at the same time letting you know that he was anything but a saint and that he had no problem having sex with any woman who was willing to give it to him as well as using violence to achieve the aims that he was after. That part of the story, however, may more likely than not, at least in my opinion, is an embellishment of Seville's. And I say that because that was something else that he did quite often, is he would tell you his story, but it was never the same story twice, and it was always a little bit bigger each time he told it. I have no doubt that he had some hard-nosed people working for him while he was running the dance halls, but the idea that he had, for lack of a better term, full-blown mafia members working at the dance hall for him and that the craze had no problem with this, that's a bit of a stretch. You know, he probably had some low-level thugs that were working for him who may have been known to the craze and may in fact have worked with them on various jobs here and there, but I doubt any he had anybody who was actually within their organization and high up enough to matter, you know, busting skulls inside of his dance hall. Because of how successful Seville was in the Plaza Dance Hall in Manchester, it was decided to make him the manager of all of the dance halls in the north of England. Uh, Seville was sent back to Leeds by Mecca. Seville had much the same type of success back in Leeds as he had had in London and then Manchester, and he upped his ante buying more outlandish cars, but also taken to riding his bicycle into work, wearing a red, white, and blue track suit with a large flag that said Mega Dance Hall hanging from the back of the bike, and Seville went to great pains to make himself visible in the downtown area of Leeds where the dance hall was situated. And it was said that a social scene sprang up around Seville with 
a number of individuals riding bikes who would follow Seville on his little outings, but more importantly than that, at least to our story, is the social circle that sprang up around Seville behind closed doors. Much like in Manchester, Seville started to surround himself with some very powerful, important people from, you know, the local government as well as the police forces. In doing so, and in being as flamboyant as he was with, you know, the wild clothing and the cars and the hair, it was painted a different color constantly or cut into a new strange shape. Seville was like a walking billboard that flashed at the young women who attended his club and called to them like a beacon, and again, just as he had everywhere else, Seville was able to, I don't want to be crude here, but it's the best way to put it, have his pick of the litter. He, he would, he did the same things in Leeds that he was doing in Manchester, but he was also known to have a place called the Black Flat, which was a, uh, apartment he had that was entirely painted black, and it was known among the youth and those within his circle that Seville regularly took young girls and women back to his apartment to do with as he wished. An interesting antidote that comes out of this period of time comes from a man by the name of Dennis Lemon who said that one day Seville showed up for work basically pissed off, and when he tried to find out what was going on, he was informed that Seville was doing court the next day because he had gotten into some trouble with a few young girls. Later, when he tried to find out what had become of the case, he was told that Seville did what he had done in the past, which is he had paid the young women off. This is really the only story about Seville paying off his alleged victims that is out there, but if true, it does paint a very different picture of Jimmy Seville than the one that was present in the public for so many years, that of somebody who knows he's doing wrong and will do anything that he has to in order to ensure that he does not get into trouble for it. In 1959, Seville had his first major exposure on a television program. This was on the BBC's Jukebox Jury, and he made certain to dress as out, as outlandishly as he possibly could. Uh, this ensured that he would receive a write-up in a local uh, music paper, as well as just draw attention to himself and Seville as he did throughout his career, never made mention of what he was wearing. He acted as though it was completely natural, and this is one of the tricks that he had learned. It's, you know, to quote him, it's great to be odd, but if you have to point it out to people, then it takes away some of the fun of it. So Seville went on to this sh on this show, comp you know, looking like a madman. And a few days later, he wrote to a number of different television stations. One or one of which was the Tyne Tees Television. Seville informed the Tyne Tees Television company who he was and that he would be in Manchester on Thursday if they cared to meet the man who had been on jukebox jury. According to Seville, when he, a few days after this, he got a letter saying yes, they wanted to meet him, so Thursday he drove up to Newcastle in his Rolls Royce, parking in front of the building before going in to see the station's managers. And upon seeing this man before them who had pink hair, he pretty much blew them away because individuals, specifically men who had, 
you know, outlandish clothing on and wildly different hair coloring were, they weren't even a novelty at this point. It just was something that didn't happen. Men were expected to be respectable looking at all times, whether or not they were in the business world or in the entertainment industry. I mean, if you look back at Elvis Presley or Buddy Holly or anyone who is a name in the entertainment industry, despite how they may have portrayed them themselves in whatever their chosen profession was, was they always looked respectable and presentable. You know, they might be wearing an open collar shirt, but they were dressed in, you know, a manner that would be seen as respectable for the times. Jimmy Seville was the complete opposite of that. Not long after his meeting at Time Tees Television, Seville got a call from a man by the name of Pat Campbell who worked for Decker, Decca Records. Decca was set and in position to be the distributor for Warner Brothers Records albums in the United Kingdom. The reason that this man contacted Seville was he was looking for a radio DJ to host a show on Radio Luxembourg. I need to explain this for those of you who may not understand the history of radio and television in the United Kingdom. The British Broadcasting Company, which is in reality a government organization, did not allow uh, commercial radio and television to be broadcast from inside the United Kingdom. They had a lock on everything. So you had a handful of television stations that were outside of England who would broadcast to within the country, specifically radio stations. They were called pirate radio stations. Radio Luxembourg was one of these radio stations. They would broadcast music that the BBC would not play. They would actually play the stuff that the kids wanted to hear. And they kind of branded themselves as these rebel rock radio stations as opposed to, you know, the stuffy old BBC with its airs of it being prim and proper. And the BBC really hated these stations because they were cutting into their audience. Well, Seville was hired to host a radio program on Radio Luxembourg in what eventually became known as the Payola Scandal. And for those unfamiliar with the Payola Scandal... Record companies were paying both radio stations as well as DJs, and not this isn't just in the UK, this was in the US as well, to play specific records. Let's just say hypothetically, um, the Bee Gees released a new single and the radio the record company wanted it to receive a lot of airplay in order to boost its sales they would go to the radio stations and pay them to play it you know three times over a two-hour period which eventually led to a load of shit because how dare you know they pay these companies money to play their record which let's be honest it's not far off of what is happening in the radio nowadays the record companies kind of let the radio stations know which singles of theirs they would like to be played more often and because of that they will get maybe not cash kickbacks but they will get some form of remittance whether it be you know trips or they'll send their radio or their musicians into the radio station to do lead-ins for them or provide them with an interview 
Seville ended up having a tryout for Radio Luxembourg in London. And apparently he ran for five minutes and played three records, after which he was told, thanks, we've heard enough. Two days after this, Seville went, was sent on a two-week trip to New York, a courtesy of Mecca Dance Halls, who had named Seville Manager Winter Season Gold Cup. But while he was in New York, a cable arrived from Warner Brothers, letting him know that he needed to return to the UK immediately as he was being picked up as a DJ for the Radio Luxembourg show. To say that Jimmy Seville was very quickly the most popular DJ on Radio Luxembourg is an understatement. They were pretty upfront with the fact that it was a Warner Brothers show that he was hosting. However, Seville had an unusual rapport with his audience, and the music that he played very quickly entered onto the mainstream charts. And this led to other opportunities for Seville. A month after he started his show for Radio Luxembourg, the owners of Tyne T's television contacted him to let him know that they would be starting a new weekly pop music show aimed at teenagers that would be co-hosted by a 20-year-old woman by the name of Valerie Masters. This show was called Young at Heart, and it ran for eight weeks. At this point, the myth of Jimmy Seville really begins to build upon itself. He's starting to get popular on television. He is very popular on Radio Luxembourg, so much so, in fact, that he moves from not only doing his Warner Brothers show, but within... A few months, he is doing at least five half-hour shows on the radio station, one of which was the Teen and Twenty Disc Club, which became so popular that Seville actually had a fan club created that included membership cards. And Seville was an equal opportunity offender in this regard. He even tried to get what he termed as the Under the Bed Clothes Club to listen into his show. Under the Bed Clothes meant that he wanted the kids to hide underneath their blankets and sheets with their radios and listen along as he his show ran. Which, if you've watched any movie to this period of time, there's always that one kid hiding under his covers listening to the radio or reading a book. Jimmy Seville was actually pushing for children to do this, so who knows, that may have been an invention of his own that he popularized that has gone on to become a part of pop culture. As 1960 wore on and Seville's popularity continued to build on itself, he was given a unique opportunity. In January of 1961, he flew to Los Angeles and presented Elvis Presley with a gold record on behalf of Decca Records, if you'll, who, if you'll remember, was a subsidiary of Warner Brothers. Seville ended up being photographed with Elvis Presley, who was in Los Angeles filming a movie at the time, and he was so impressed by, you know, the fact that he had gotten to meet this man, he had the photographs blown up into large picture boards, which were placed outside of the Mecca Dance Hall in Leeds, which he still managed. One little thing that I think is interesting, given Seville's proclivity for younger women as well as Elvis's, you have to wonder if these two individuals hit it off and if perhaps they 
participated in some crimes of some fashion at this period of time that we do not know about. That's something that has to be left for speculation. Seville was a master showman, but he was also the master of self-promotion. As I stated, he had these pictures blown up into large picture boards that he put outside of the dance hall. He also gave a interview with a reporter where he talked about being the first DJ to ever be photographed with Elvis Presley. This self-promotion continued to push Seville's star power and name recognition higher. He sold pick copies of his picture through all of his Radio Luxembourg shows. He sold the copies of the picture at the dance hall. He kept most of the money, but some of it he did give to the charity known as the National Playing Field Association. According to Seville, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, was the patron of the National Playing Fields Association, and Philip was so impressed with what it was that Seville was doing that he arranged for a meeting between the two of them, and they became fast friends. Jimmy Seville never did anything in his life that didn't have some kind of an angle to it that would benefit him. It is almost certain that he specifically chose the National Playing Fields Association because Prince Philip was the patron of it, and he knew that in giving them money, it would bring him to the attention of Prince Philip. Again, if we think back to when he was in Manchester, he builds this circle of power around himself. In Leeds, he builds another circle of power around himself. Now that he's starting to become a much bigger star, he's reaching out and pulling in much more powerful people to surround himself with, whether that's as protection or just to give off the airs that he is a, an important person. That I will let you decide on that, but we can see here Jimmy Seville is now starting to place building blocks around himself of people who are way higher than the local government police forces. He's got the Duke of Edinburgh, you know, as a friend, and he's the first of many, many, many people within the British government as well as the entertainment industry who have some form of power that he's going to build around him this, you know, wall of power with Seville at the center of it. It's almost as though Seville was building a cushion around himself because he was smart enough to understand that at some point he might need these people and their names or their titles to help him get out of a sticky situation. Which is very, really quite brilliant if you think about it. This nobody from the bad side of Leeds is now, he's in his 30s, he's on television, he's on the radio, he's running a dance hall. Everybody has their preconceived notion of him, but behind the scenes, he's doing a lot of bad things with young women, and he's also consolidating power and building a network of individuals who will look out for Seville's own best interest, which is namely Jimmy Seville. Alright, we are going to call it this week. We will come back next week as Seville continues to build his empire of self, and stories about him start to leak out in the press and how it, these stories were dealt with. I hope you've enjoyed this second part of The Life and Crimes of Jimmy Seville. Again, please Subscribe and leave a five-star review on your favorite podcast app. 
the Death Cast is a production of Corpse Creek Publishing. Until next week, stay morbid.